Welcome to the Linen Hall Library's online events programme for August. You'll be pleased to hear that we have reopened the library building. As far as possible, everything will be as you remember, but some important changes have been put in place to ensure that everyone can continue to use the library safely. Before planning your visit to the library, we strongly advise that you check our website at www.linenhall.com. Our ever popular events programme will remain online for the foreseeable future. So again, please keep an eye on our website and our social media channels for news of our events and how to get involved. This is the first talk in a new series which we are calling From the Linen Hall Archives. The Linen Hall Library possesses a wealth of archival material across many genres and it is our aim through this lecture series to highlight some of the hidden treasures from our collection, but also more importantly, to encourage more public engagement with the collections uh, across the board. Each month, I will unearth uh, an interesting story from our archives or an interesting item and bring it to life in the form of a talk. Other topics which are in the pipeline include Edward Carson's personal scrapbook, the Belfast engineering strike of 1919, according to our archives, and an illuminated address for Joseph Devlin, MP for West Belfast, and many, many more besides. Now, having come up with the idea for a new series at the beginning of the year, I embarked on a fairly random process of rummaging through the Linen Hall's archives for inspiration. The first archive box that caught my eye was that of the Ulster Literary Theatre, the group of which WB Yeats described as the only dramatic society apart from our own which is doing serious artistic work. The box contained many interesting items, most of which had belonged to Rutherford Main, a pseudonym for Samuel Waddell, Irish playwright and founder of the Ulster Literary Theatre, along with Joseph Campbell in 1904. A presentation then about Rutherford Main, the archive, the Ulster Literary Theatre, seemed like it was going to be a good option at that point. Then, just as I was about to close up the box, happy that there was enough material for a talk, I stumbled upon an old piece of paper which had been folded up into the style of an envelope with some erratic handwriting on it. My curiosity got the better of me and encouraged me to open it. Upon doing so, I was confronted with a lock of dark brown hair. Immediately my thoughts turned to Henry Joy McCracken. There had been rumours in the library that once upon a time we may have held a lock of McCracken's hair, though nothing had ever turned up, and it seemed to me very unlikely. Yet here I was with a lock of unidentified hair inside a scrap of paper. Naturally, I wondered for a moment if I'd cracked the case. The scrap of paper was my only hope really of finding clues to help me identify the owner of the hair. On closer inspection, the handwriting appeared to read, also Joseph's hair. The dark hair is Aunt Sarah's. The paper was letterheaded, containing the details, William H. Campbell, contractor, Loretto Cottage, Castlebury Road, Belfast. Instantly, I knew I was dealing with the poet Joseph Campbell, and only because I happened to lead some historical walks and tours in East Belfast, I knew about Loretto Cottage and I knew of Joseph Campbell. He actually features on one of my tours. And for that reason, I'm convinced that Joseph's hair on this occasion found me rather than the other way around. Now, I must, convince, I must confess at the outset that my interest in Joseph Campbell is on a purely political level and not literary. Anyone who knows me will confirm uh, that poetry isn't really my thing, but I am trying. So please forgive me if you've tuned in to hear a critique of Campbell's writing. You will be disappointed, I'm afraid. The aim of this talk is to highlight the life and times of a remarkable man, born not far from where I was in East Belfast, yet finds himself among the founding members of the Irish Volunteers in 1913 playing a role in the Easter Rising of 1916, working on crucial Sinn Féin by-election campaigns and ultimately being imprisoned during the Irish Civil War. He features on my 1916 walking tour in East Belfast and a vast majority of people who I encounter haven't heard of him. So here is his story. 
Joseph Campbell was born on the 15th of July, 1879 in Belfast. The family who were Catholic lived at Loretto Cottage, a, a sandstone villa on the Castlereagh Road in East Belfast, where the QE1 snooker club is now situated. Loretto was subsequently occupied by the Emerson family, who were milkmen before the cottage was eventually demolished in 1974. Joseph began his school life aged seven at St Matthew's National School in what we would now call the Short Strand District of East Belfast. Another plaque on the side of the school commemorates him. School helped him become an enthusiastic reader from an early age. Summer holidays for Joseph meant visits to Fleury Bridge, a Gaelic-speaking area of Armagh where his grandfather resided. It was during these visits to Fleury Bridge that he developed an interest in Irish history and of the Irish language to complement his love for books and for reading. The first public event Joseph can remember was the Phoenix Park assassinations of the 6th of May 1882 when Frederick Cavendish, the Chief Secretary for Ireland, and Thomas Burke, the Permanent Undersecretary and of no relation to me, were stabbed to death with surgical knives by an underground Fenian organisation calling themselves the Invincibles. He also remembers Election Day 1886 when Thomas Sexton was elected as the Home Rule MP for West Belfast, helped by Joseph's father, William. It was a personal triumph for the family and Joseph remembers how the election affected the children. Quote, I was going to school at the time, St Matthew's. Miss Colcoff was preparing us for the ceremonies of Holy Week, teaching us the Latin of the hymn Vexilla Regis, which we learnt by the rote. At rehearsal, when we got to the line, Tam Sancta Membra Tangier, we would shout in unison, Tom Sexton, Member of Parliament. A good example of the exuberant irreverence of schoolboys in a province fighting for its religious and political freedom, end of quote. Joseph's father was a fervent Parnellite and supporter of Home Rule for Ireland. He sometimes took young Joseph to the political gatherings at St Mary's Hall. Joseph left school at 16 to work in his father's construction business. Around this time, however, he became psychologically ill and required a period of rest for over three years. It turned out to be a defining moment though, because during this time, he immersed himself in books, folklore, and a love for the history of Belfast with his newfound friend, Francis Joseph Bigger. These years witnessed the stirrings of an Irish Gaelic cultural revival in Ireland, and Campbell had his own connection to it. In 1898, for example, Ethna Carberry, who was Joseph's cousin, and Alice Milligan founded the Shan Van Vacht periodical. Its purpose was to rally the scattered and disheartened few who had not lost faith after Charles Stuart Parnell's death. Ethna Carberry's husband provides us with an insight into the impact of the Shan Van Vacht. Quote, for three and a half years, these two girls edited the magazine and managed it. They inspired patriotic writers to life again. Today, only the few remember that it was these two girls with their wonderful little magazine, patriotic, poetic, faring, stimulating, who revived Ireland's spirit when it seemed dead and turned the tide of Ireland's fortune when to many it seemed flown forever. End of quote. When the Gaelic League spread to Belfast, its first branch was set up in East Belfast of all places, at 32 Upper Beersbridge Road, the home of P.T. McGinley. Joseph Campbell joined the Gaelic League at this time when he began Irish language lessons and became an authority on Irish literature. His early poetry and articles during this period were published in the Northern Whig and the United Irishman newspapers, and they reflect his love for all things Irish. The United Irishman paper was edited by Arthur Griffith. He and Campbell soon developed good rapport. Campbell would often travel to Dublin and was met by Griffith at Amiens Street Station, we know it today as Connolly Street Station, and Griffith gave him an historical tour of Dublin. And Campbell recalled, I can see him now in his black hat, thick pince nez and coloured tie, looped with a gold ring. His feet were malformed, I recall, and he had to wear specially made boots. 
of Dublin, Joseph Campbell said, fate has led me in my wanderings to many famous cities. I have seen nothing more lovely than the stone facade of Trinity, the classic black and white pillars of the Bank of Ireland and the river mirrored cupola of the Custom House. In 1904, Campbell put lyrics to a series of Donegal airs collected by Herbert Hughes. Quote, our technique was simple, said Campbell. Herbert would come to Loretto, seated at the piano, he would play over the airs, improvising an accompaniment as he proceeded. First in the natural tempo and then more slowly, so that I could catch and absorb the peculiar quality in each, end of quote. From these sessions came some of Joseph Campbell's most notable work, such as My Lag and Love and The Garden Mother's Lullaby. In a set of 30, they became the songs of Ulla and were published in 1904, kindly funded by Francis Joseph Bigger. My Lag and Love remains Campbell's best known work. Of it, Robert Farron, the Irish poet and director of broadcasting at RTE said, quote, the Gaelic voice sings through all his poetry and sings, I mean, for he was a fine lyric poet and many people who hear his songs or indeed who sing them professionally pay no honour to Joseph Campbell for the greatest song written by an Irish poet in this century. It is, of course, My Lag and Love. End of quote. My Lag and Love has been reproduced and covered many, many times by many different names such as Van Morrison, The Chieftains, Charlotte Church, Lisa Hannigan, Sinead O'Connor, The Coors, and I could go on. The revivalist spirit in Ulster led to the formation of the Ulster Literary Theatre, of which Joseph Campbell was a key member, along with people like Boomer Hobson and Sam Waddell, who we've already encountered, better known as Rutherford Mayan. He was also Joseph Campbell's brother-in-law, having married Campbell's sister, Josephine. The founders of the Ulster Literary Theatre set out to write and produce distinctively Ulster plays and commentary of the political and social conditions in Ulster. They produced a quarterly journal of which Joseph was the editor and his brother John, who went on to be an important artist in his own right, designed the covers. The Ulster Literary Theatre faded away in the 1920s. Rutherford Mayan recalled in 1942 some of the reasons why this was the case. Quote, we never managed to raise enough money to start building a theatre of our own. And besides that, don't forget that even to the end, 10 or 12 years ago, we were always a bit of a cloud. It's the sort of thing that's always happening in Ulster. After all, when you've a flaming nationalist like Boomer Hobson or Joe Campbell or Francis Joseph Bigger as a member of your society, it takes a lot of explaining away. End of quote. In 1905, Joseph Campbell moved from Belfast to Dublin, where he continued to work on his poetry and plays, but with only limited success. He felt that his Ulster roots invited unfair criticism, and where praise was given, it was generally of a begrudging nature. He was otherwise ignored. Thus, he returned to Belfast looking for work, and was ironically turned down for an assistant librarian post at the Linen Hall Library. More importantly, though, he was looking for an audience. And in Belfast, this was hard to come by. So in 1906, he went to London where he wrote prolifically and published more volumes of work. He also met Nancy Maud, who became his wife. And then he returned to Dublin in 1911 to be with her. In Dublin, Campbell used the Bailey pub as a meeting place to liaise with people like Arthur Griffith, who we've already mentioned, and also Tom Kettle. There was also Seamus Connolly's cottage at Balali and George Houston's house at Rathfarnham, where Thomas McDonough lived. McDonough was eventually executed for his part in the Easter Rising of 1916. Campbell also became a friend and admirer of Patrick Pierce, and in 1912 he joined the staff at Pierce's school, St. Enda's. He later translated into English some of Pierce's stories. In October 1913, Joseph Campbell published another body of work called Irishry. However, within a month of his achievement, he found himself acutely involved in militant Irish nationalism. On Friday the 14th of November 1913, 
in Wynn's Hotel, Dublin, a dozen Irish nationalists who had been selected by Boomer Hobson and Theo Rahilly gathered to meet with Owen McNeill. Here they discussed the formation of an Irish volunteer movement in response to the emergence of the Ulster Volunteer Force. According to Theo Rahilly, these men were deliberately selected, quote, because they were amongst the sincerest nationalist, nationalists of my acquaintance in Dublin. One of them was Joseph Campbell. Others included men like Patrick Pierce and Eamon Kent. And the intention of the meeting was to form a provisional committee for the Irish volunteers. According to Boomer Hobson, though, Joseph Campbell opted not to sit on the Irish Volunteers Provisional Committee, as he was not terribly interested in the movement. But he did continue to support it where he could, being a regular face at Sunday route marches and drills. In September, in December 1913, he acted as steward at a mass meeting of nationalists at the Rotunda Skating Rink. And in 1914, with Theo Rahilly and others, Campbell addressed a meeting at Glen Cullen to organise a company of volunteers in the district. By the summer of 1915, Campbell was lending the lawn of his home, now at Glen Cullen House, to the Irish Citizen Army for the purposes of armed drill. The attention that this brought from the local constabulary, however, led him to move his family out to Wicklow. Here, the Campbells rented Kilmolan House. This was to be their home for the next six years. The Irish Rebellion broke out on Easter Monday, 1916. It's no surprise to learn that Joseph Campbell was in the middle of it, given the company that he kept. Although not directly involved in the planning of the rising, he was well acquainted with Patrick Pierce, Thomas McDonough, and Joseph Plunkett, not to mention that the Irish Citizen Army had been training in his garden. His wife Nancy wrote in her diary on, the, on Tuesday the 25th of April 1916, quote, Heard of rising in Dublin. No post or letters. Found trains running into Dublin. So Jay, Gilly and I went in to see what we could see. Rather horrid experience. Saw a poor man shot by soldiers in Stevens Green. Jay had to get him over the railings at the hospital. Gilly and I, after finding tea by luck in a private hotel and seeing a nice volunteer shooting out of a window, got home by train about six. Jay got home a little later, end of quote. By Joseph Campbell's own admission, he went back to Dublin over several days to do intelligence and scouting work for the rebels between Dublin and Enniskerry. Desmond Fitzgerald, the future Fine Gael minister in the Doyle, stayed two nights hiding at Campbell's home before he was eventually arrested. They had previously spent time together in London as part of the Tour Eiffel group of poets and writers. Campbell's activities prompted raids from the Dublin Military Police, the RIC and British soldiers. He recalled, I had documents and papers hidden in beehives and ditch walls away from the house. I was not arrested. Wouldn't you just love to know what was in those documents, eh? Campbell wrote about the Easter Rising in three of his poems, Raven's Rock, Fires, and the Storm Thrush in the Shaking Tree. Notwithstanding his apparent lack of interest in the Irish volunteer movement in 1913, Joseph Campbell, Campbell's story from 1916 onwards is undoubtedly a political one, though he hadn't neglected his poetry. He became an active member of Sinn Féin and worked on several of their election campaigns, including Dr. Patrick McCartan's campaign in South Armagh and the campaigns of Eamon de Alera, Joe McGuinness and Arthur Griffith. Griffith was elected in East Cavan on 21st of June 1918 and Kevin O'Shea recalled in his Bureau of Military History witness statement how Campbell had worked on the campaign. Quote, in particular, I had a very active and well-informed group of canvassers headed by Joseph Campbell, the poet, who during the long waiting period made an exhaustive house-to-house -house canvas of the area. End of quote. Campbell clearly did a good job though, as Griffith was elected in a closely fought contest. The by-election was fought mainly on the issue of conscription uh, during the First World War, with Ireland's representation at the Versailles Peace Conference a secondary issue. Sinn Féiners told these Cavan electors that a vote for Griffith was a nail in the coffin of conscription. 
Campbell then appears to have had some involvement with the IRA after the creation of the first Doyle in 1919 and the violence that followed it. Virtually no details exist of his IRA activities, except for a Bureau of Military History witness statement by Joseph O'Connor, officer commanding of the 3rd Dublin Battalion IRA. When the IRA was organizing across the, the country, uh, he was tasked with setting up companies of men in the adjacent districts. He recalled, quote, when the oath of allegiance was being administered to the men in Shankill, I noticed among them taking the oath, Joseph Campbell, the poet. Sometime afterwards, I called a meeting of the unit leaders for his home at Kilmolan House. During the progress of the meeting, our scouts informed us that the place was surrounded by enemy forces and that we were completely cut off. Naturally, we thought that they were out after us. The forces consisted of military, naval and police forces. However, they passed the house by and we breathed a sigh of relief. Campbell was a member of the Republican District Court for East Wicklow. Again, from the Bureau of Military History, Patrick Logan of the Wicklow IRA takes up the story. There was another memorable occasion in the District Court. Larry O'Brien was presiding. When the late Joseph Campbell, the great patriot poet of the Nine Penny Fiddle, etc., arrived and caused an uproar that might have been more serious. Joe claimed that he had been instructed from HQ to preside at the court. Some heated and at times nasty exchanges took place between Campbell and O'Brien, leading, leading to O'Brien ordering the arrest of Campbell. I can still see Campbell standing in the middle of the room in his green uniform, knee breeches and the rest, with hand outstretched like the pose of Emmett in one of the beautiful paintings that we see of Emmett. Campbell declared, among other things, that he felt sure his old and gallant comrades in the IRA would not lay a hand on him. Those of us who knew Joe would not do so, but some others, not long in the movement, advanced to carry out O'Brien's orders. When two shots were fired from a revolver and pandemonium was let loose, in the midst of it all, Campbell raised his hands and called for order. Order was immediately restored. We brought him out of the hall and away. When the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed in December 1921, Joseph Campbell opposed it as an Ulster man and as an Irish Republican. One of those who did support it was Robert Barton, Sinn Féin member for West Wicklow, who defended it. Quote, as the lesser of two outrages forced upon me and between which I had to choose, end of quote. Barton was nevertheless firmly committed to the Irish Republic and despite signing the treaty, he did work to oppose it. Nevertheless, Barton received a letter from Joseph Campbell to advise him that he had signed away Ireland's birthright. Campbell also wrote to Arthur Griffith to say, this will split Ireland from top to bottom and Lloyd George knows it. Griffith never replied. Consequently, the Irish Civil War broke out in 1922 and Campbell, seemingly not one to miss out on anything, offered his military services to Brigadier Andy MacDonnell, commander of the IRA in Bray. Within a month, on the 7th of July, 1922, he was arrested by a free state soldier and brought as a prisoner um, to the Imperial Hotel in Bray. Two weeks later, he was moved to Wellington Barracks, Dublin. The Wicklow People newspaper reported that Campbell acted as a leader of the prisoners and addressed the gathered crowd calling for cheers for the Republic as the arrested men were led away. While in prison, Campbell, along with others, went on hunger strike for unconditional release. He and the others in his prison hut kept the strike up for a period of 10 days, though other prisoners kept it going for longer. However, it was to no avail. Campbell spent 17 months in prison before eventually being released from the Curragh um, in December 1923, during a general amnesty of Republican prisoners. His jail term had changed him, opting to leave politics behind and instead put all his efforts into his pursuit of literature. He recorded that the year after his release, 1924, was the most di difficult year of his life. His marriage fell apart and he was suffering from depression. Thus, he decided to go and join his brother in the United States of America, leaving Ireland on the 19th of March, 1925. In America, 
Amber lived in New York while lecturing at Fordham University, founding the University School of Irish Studies in 1928, before returning to Ireland in 1939 to settle at Glen Cree, County Wicklow, before he eventually passed away on the 6th of June, 1944, in Enniskerry. An obituary in the Catholic Standard newspaper read, Ireland lost a good poet, alas, not very well known by the younger generation. When Joseph Campbell died, he was found dead on June the 9th in his cottage at Lachandara near Enniskerry, County Wicklow. In this cottage, he had lived alone and there he had died alone. Neighbours had noticed that no smoke rose from the chimney. The fire had indeed gone out. Thank you for tuning in to this online talk from the Linen Hall Library. Our next scheduled event is on Wednesday the 19th of August for World Photo Day, when photographer and artist John Boucher will explore a series of iconic photographs which have inspired his work to date, as well as the highs and lows of his own career in photography. Thank you and stay safe.